Goonie Bird Green by Lois Lowry, illustrated by Mitty Thomas. Chapter 3 On Friday, Goonie Bird was wearing capri pants, a satin tank top, and a long string of pearls. Her red hair was twisted into one long braid, which is, was decorated with plastic flowers. There were flip-flops on her feet. You look beautiful, Keiko said to Goonie Bird in an admiring whisper. Yes, I know, Goonie Bird replied. Thank you, Co Keiko. She walked to the front of the room classroom when Mrs. Pigeon told her it was time. Malcolm was back in the classroom. He was at his desk, writing, I will never put anything in my nose 100 times on a piece of lined paper. The nurse had told him to do that. She said it would keep his hands busy. How come Goony Bird gets to go to the stand in front of the class? Malcolm asked. Shh! Everybody except Felicia and Anne said to Malcolm. Listen! Today, Goony Bird said, I have a very exciting story to tell you. In my story, there's a long journey, a mystery, and a rescue. Mrs. Pigeon, seated at her desk, had begun correcting some smelling, spelling papers. She looked up. Listen, second graders, she said. Hear the different things that Goony Bird is putting into her story? That is what good storytellers do. Goony Bird listened patiently to the teacher. Then she stood up straight and did some breathing exercises. Finally, she took a deep breath and looked at the class. I am ready to begin, she said at last. The title of the story for today will be How Goony Bird Came from China on a Flying Carpet. Just like Aladdin, Fairy Tuckerman said in a loud whisper. Fairy, pay attention, please, Goony Bird said. I like to have absolutely all eyes on me. Then, when the class became silent, all except Felicia, Felicia Ann, who had been silent all along, and almost all eyes, even Mrs. Pigeons were on her, she began. How Goony Bird Came from China on a Flying Carpet Once upon a time, just last month, Mr. and Mrs. Green decided to take their little girl, Goony Bird, and move away from the place where they had always lived. They had always lived in China, but now Mr. Green had a new job, and his new job was in Water Tower. That's here, Chelsea said aloud. I live in Water Tower. Goony Bird stopped talking. She arranged her pearl necklace so that it draped was draped over one shoulder. Me too, Tricia said. We all live in Water Tower, Ben pointed out. That's why we go to Water Tower Elementary School. Class, Mrs. Pigeon warned. Mrs. Pigeon, Goony Bird said politely, let me take care of this. Children, she said in a firm voice, I cannot tell a story if I am constantly interrupted. There will be time for questions and comments. Please raise your hand if you want to say something. It is very distracting for me if you call out. Sorry, Trisha said. Sorry, Chelsea said. Sorry, Ben added. The class waited. Goonybird looked at them all sternly. Then she did some breathing exercises and began again. They had always lived in China, but now Mr. Green had a new job, and his new job was in Water Tower. So they packed carefully. It took many days. First, Mr. Green had to pack his 43 sets of false teeth. Then, Mrs. Green had to pack her dancing shoes and her bathing suits, and Goony Bird had to pack all of her belongings, which in included a money collection. Finally, their furniture was loaded onto a moving van, and the Green family waved goodbye as the moving van drove away from China and started its journey to Water Tower. Goony Bird stopped. Every child in the class had a raised hand, and even Mrs. Pigeon was waving her arm. I'll have an intermission now for questions, Goony Bird said. Chelsea, yours first. Why did Mr. Green have 43 pairs of false teeth? Chelsea asked. The false teeth are not part of the story, Goony Bird said. Malcolm? Malcolm had looked up from his I will not put anything in my nose paper. His eyes were very wide. Tell about the money collection, he said. That's another story, Goony Bird said. Beanie? What are you going to tell about the prince and the diamonds? Beanie asked. Goonybird thought it over. On Monday I'll tell it, she said. 
Now, there's time for one more question before I continue. Mrs. Pigeon, did you have your hand raised? Mrs. Pigeon nodded. Goonie Bird, she said in a nice voice, you have an amazing imagination, and we think you are wonderful at telling stories, don't we, class? She looked around, and almost all the children nodded. But I want to be certain that the children understand these are made-up stories, so I want to point out my stories are all absolutely true, Goonybird said. I want to point out, Mrs. Pigeon went on, that of course we all know that China is a foreign country across the ocean and that a moving van could never drive from China to Water Tower. Goonybird rearranged her pearls and sighed. Hmm, Mrs. Pigeon, she said, why don't we take a few minutes for research? Is there an atlas in the bookcase? Mrs. Pigeon laughed and said, of course. She went to the bookcase and looked, took out a book of maps called an atlas. Now, said Goonie Bird, would you find out if there are other Chinas? Other Chinas? I don't think. Mrs. Pigeon began turning the pages of the atlas. She found the index at the back. My goodness, Mrs. Pigeon said after a minute. There's a China in Texas. said Goonie Bird. And what else? There's a China in Maine. Correct, said Goonie Bird. And? California, there's a China Lake. Oh, and my goodness, look, in North Carolina. And now it's time to continue the story, Goonie Bird announced. Where were we? Oh, yes, I remember. The moving van had just left China. She took up the story again. Did you see what Goonie Bird did here? She had it all suspenseful. We were thinking she was from China. When there's a China, Texas, in Maine, there's something China in California and in North Carolina. So um, while we thought one thing, it was really kind of about something else. But she kept our interest anyways, didn't she? All right, let's continue the story. After the moving van left China, the Green family loaded up their station wagon with five big suitcases. Then they added a lawnmower that they had forgotten to put in the moving van, a cooler full of ham sandwiches and iced tea, and a bundled up stack of National Geographics, and an old and an orange and white cat named Catman, who had no tail because he had flicked his former tail once under the lawnmower. The last thing they put into the station wagon was a rolled-up rug from the front porch of their house. It was too long to fit. They tried it sideways and folded and upside down, but it still wouldn't fit. Let's leave it behind, Mr. Green suggested. But Mrs. Green began to cry. It was my mother's, she said. There's a stain on it where my mother spilled some black bean soup 40 years ago. I feel sentimental about this rug. So Mr. Green agreed to take the rug because it made him cry, too, if his wife cried. He decided to put the back window of the station wagon down so that the end of the rolled-up rug could stick out. He made certain that everything was nicely arranged and that Catman had a comfortable place to sleep on the back seat, just beneath the end of the rug and next to the place where Goonie Bird would sit. Mr. Green and Mrs. Green and Goonie Bird Green all got into the car and drove away from China, starting their long journey to Water Tower. They drove for many, many hours. They ate all of the ham sandwiches and drank all of the iced tea. They stopped to get gas. They went to the bathroom. They played the car radio and listened to news and operas and football games and talk shows about love relationships. Suddenly, Gunnabrick glanced down and noticed with dismay that her beloved Catman had disappeared. She looked around the floor of the back seat, but Catman was not there. She heard a small sound, like a purr coming from inside the rolled-up rug. She knew that Catman had entered the rug. He probably found it warm and dark and cozy place. But Goonie Bird was worried about Catman. She decided to try and get him out. She reached into the rolled-up center of the rug, but he slithered away, beyond her hands. She looked at the back of her parents' heads, wondering if she should tell them about the problem with Catman. But her mother was dozing, and her father was driving, watching the road carefully and listening to a radio program about whales. So 
Granny Bird decided to wiggle into the rug herself to rescue Catman. Oh no, Keiko cried. I'm going to faint. Shh, the other children said. It was dark and dusty and a very tight squeeze inside the rolled up rug. But Goonie Bird wiggled inch by inch toward Catman. Catman slithered away inch by inch. She could see his glittering eyes as he backed away from her hands. Goonie Bird was determined to rescue him. She continued forward. Suddenly, an amazing thing happened. Even though Goonie Bird was not very large and did not weigh very much, and was not wearing her heavy diamond earrings from the palace that day, her weight inside the rolled up rug caused it to tilt. At that moment, Mr. Green leaned forward to change the radio station, and the car went over a pothole in the road. The rolled up rug containing both Catman and Goonie Bird slid out of the back of the station wagon and flew through the air before it landed at the side of the road in some thick grass beside a fence post. A cow chewing on a purple flower looked curiously at it and then wandered away. The station wagon drove on, around a curve in the road. Slowly the rug unrolled. Catman's fur was standing on end, and if he had had a tail, his tail would have been sticking straight up in the air. For a moment, Catman stood still, looking at Goonie Bird. Then he ran away very fast. Goonie Bird sat up. She was not entirely sure what had happened, but she was not hurt. She simply wondered where her family was, and her cat, and the car. Other cars stopped, and people got out. Many people offered her a drink of water from their bottles of Evian, but Goonie Bird wasn't thirsty. After a while, a police car with a flashing light came. A TV reporter came and a cameraman. While the policeman talked on his radio, the TV reporter, a woman with very large hair, interviewed Goonie Bird and called her the girl who had a flying carpet ride. In the interview, Goonie Bird described Catman and asked people to call the station if they found him, but she never got Catman back. Eventually, the police car took her to her parents, who were both crying at the gas station four miles down the road. When Goonie Bird and her parents were finally reunited, everyone, including two policemen, a TV reporter, and the gas station owner, hugged and kissed and did the tango. The end. What a lovely story, Mrs. Pigeon said, and an exciting one, too. But a little sad to lose your kitty that way. Catman is not a kitty, Goonie Bird said. He is a cat. And I didn't say I lost him. I just said I never got him back. So no one found him and called the TV station? Actually, they did, Goonie replied. But where is Catman now? asked Mrs. Pigeon. He was consumed by a cow, Goonie Bird said. But that's a different story. By a cow? You're joking, Mrs. Pigeon said. No, said Goonie Bird. I'm not joking. I tell only absolutely true stories. Tell it, tell it, the children called. I will, Goonie Bird said. Another day. Goonie Bird's very good at telling stories, isn't she? Do you notice how she had that suddenly in there? All right, so uh, we have this one, this book in our writing um, section. So you can think about how she thinks of stories and makes them interesting. We can also think about it as a reader. Did you notice how I changed my voice to um, sound like the characters were really excited or sad and used the punctuation to help me? So um, readers and writers, today and every day, you can use these same things that Goonie Bird does and how I was reading as you read and write your own stories and other stories um, So to help make them interesting. All right, so you're safe, you're loved, and you've got this.